Okay. We're in our 14th week in the book of Corinthians and in the community of one. And as we go through 1 Corinthians, and, you know, um, we talk a lot about community here at um, the gathering, but the Bible has a lot to say about community. Uh, another word for it's church. And if you just pay attention to, especially in the epistles, all that stuff in the New Testament behind the Gospels, you'll, you'll see so much that Paul, who wrote most of it, is just talking to this community of believers just over and over, what it means to be a part of a group, what it means to, be, to have your life that's meshed in with others. And, um, you know, I, I can just say here that, that God is, it's evident to all of us that God is moving us closer and closer into a community ourselves. Um, he's been doing that for some time. And, and this morning is just another. How many churches can you go to when people start to feel free to, to really share what's going on in their lives and really share what's in their hearts? You know, and we just, we have a rare opportunity. We really do. We have a rare opportunity. And, and I just think that God is going to do something with that, I, you know, because this is his whole vision of what a church is. So what was going on in, in Corinthians was, the, the, you know, the, the previous chapter was they had the, the gifts of the Spirit. They had, uh, the Spirit had been poured out on them. They were speaking in tongues. They had interpretation of tongues. They had discernment of spirits. They had prophecy. They had, you know, works of faith and, and uh, miracles and healings and, and um, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Paul wants them to know, wants us to know that those gifts in and of themselves are great, but they don't form a community. Those gifts don't pull people together. As a matter of fact, you know, he, he says he encourages us to go after those gifts, but he says that's not enough. Uh, actually, oftentimes the gifts kind of separate people because uh, we're human beings and somebody has, you know, Holy Spirit moves in somebody's life pretty dramatically and we go, well, who does he think he is? You know, what, what about me? And so he goes on, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, look, I want to show you a better path to follow. I want to show you a better way. Uh, don't put your emphasis on the gifts. Put your emphasis on love. He says, because if you use your gifts without love, you really don't accomplish community. You don't really accomplish the church. It makes you nothing. And in spite of all what might appear, you gain nothing at the judgment seat of Christ without love. You can't have community. So here we are. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 is where it really starts and goes through um, chapter 13. Use your ambition to try to get the greater gifts. And I'm going to show you an even better way. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give everything away that I have and hand over my body to feel good about what I've done but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it's happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that i become a man, i put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain, these three things. And the greatest of these is love. Isn't that a great chapter? I mean, it's poetic. You've heard this before. If you've been to a wedding, you, you've heard verses 4 through 7, probably the most popular verses at any kind of wedding. We call this the love chapter, you know, ministers do. Uh, 
And it makes us all, you know, we hear this and we think of marriage and we say, well, I want my husband to be like that. That's what my husband needs to be like. It's just like that right there. I need to, you know, put that on his mirror so he can look at that. And, and you know, that's my goal. I hope my husband does that. He has a few weaknesses and faults, but, you know, I'm going to work on him and I'll shape him up, right? They, they say that, that women are always trying to change their husbands and, and husbands are hoping that their wives never change. That's the way that goes. You know, but it's it's pretty common thing. So, what is love? The word that Paul uses here uh, in the Greek is agape. You probably heard that if you've hung around the church for a while. It's unlike the other kinds of love. Agape is God's sacrificial, unconditional love. Most of the time, we think of love, we think of it as an emotion, right? We all have songs that talk about love. I remember the doors, uh, hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name, you know, that's going back a ways, Tina Turner, you know, what's love but a secondhand emotion, watch that video, I was going to show that, but I thought, no, I can't really do that, Tina will scare some people, (laughs) Elvis said, I can't help but falling in love with you, is what he said, and Righteous Brothers saying, you've lost that love and feeling. Notice that I have no songs after 1970. I've just kind of stopped right there for some reason. I thought if I said that, you wouldn't point it out to me. Romantic love is very emotional. In fact, the way that love is used in our world usually means lust, really, our desire. And romantic love, let's face it, it's about I want to own you. I want to possess you. It has nothing to do usually with sacrifice. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about a a mindset, a a decision, an act of the will, a determination that whether I'm dealing with friend or foe, I'm going to seek the person's highest good. I am willing to sacrifice myself for this person, even if it's an enemy. This agape love from God is ours when we follow or we abide in him, and that's the only way that we get it. Bible tells us over and over that God is love. It's, it's the major theme of the Bible. I mean, it, it might not actually mention the word, but from the Old Testament all the way through, it's all a story of God's love for humanity. And in every story, it's there of God's sacrificial love for humanity. And I think of 1 John 4, 7 to 8. He says, Dear friends, let's love each other because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. What a high standard that is. (laughs) If we don't love, we don't know God, is what he says. And and if we know God, then we're going to love others. I mean, just kind of drink that in. What, you know, John is saying this, a guy who really knows Jesus Christ. Earlier on in that chapter in 1 John 3.16, he says, This is how we know love. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, here's, here's a little trick for you. Everybody knows John 3.16. Here's 1 John 3.16. John 3.16, God so loved the world, loved the world that he gave his only son. And this is how do we know love? In 1 John 3.16, we know love because Jesus gave his life for us, so we ought to give our lives for others. There's just two verses you can join together. So what does this look like? What what does laying down your life for your brothers and sisters really look like? Paul here gives us 15 phrases to show us what love and action is. He says the first two, love is patient, love is kind. Because this love of which he speaks comes to us, us from God. It reflects God. He's really just talking about the Lord. Patience implies a contentment with the present, not an anger about what isn't happening, but a contentment with today. God's awful patient with us, really, isn't he? Did you ever think about that, how patient the Lord is with us? You know, as 2 Peter says, we think God's slow. Okay, we pray and we pray and we think he's slow about something, but God's timing is he's just waiting, just waiting. He says he, he delays so that all might come to faith, all might come to the light is what he says. 
And when you sense that he doesn't deal with you according to your sins, you can show that same kind of love to other people. So the, the mindset here is that, okay, God has waited on me. God has been patient with me. So the very least I can do is be patient with someone else. It says and love is kind. God's kind. Used to have a lady in Versailles. Those of you that are from Versailles would know her. And she was an elder. And at the end of every prayer, she would say, Lord, help us to be kind. And that just became her trademark. She's a very kind person. God was answering her prayer. But when I think of kindness, I think, you know, that, that was her constant prayer, and that's what God is. And then having said it, patient and kindness, kind of like a headline for the rest, he, he talks about some things that love doesn't do. He says, love isn't jealous, doesn't brag, isn't arrogant. Well, you know, oftentimes people who are real go-getters, live exemplary lives, and are high achievers, great leaders, struggle with jealousy. They have everything a person might imagine. We might wonder, what in the world could they want? And yet they still have someone else that they are envious of. Uh, Thomas uh, DeLong, professor at Harvard Business School, um, interviewed 500 people, 500 high need to achieve professionals he interviewed over three years, and he said that more than 400 of them questioned their own success and brought up the name of at least one other peer who they felt had been more successful than they were. And many of these individuals are considered among the best and the brightest, and yet they are trapped by their comparing reflex. Did you catch that? Harvard Business School, 500 really top-notch go-getters, 400 out of the 500 named somebody else that they're still envious of. Like, well, he's doing better. She's doing better. I say, wow, that's just so wrong, you know. I'm glad that's not me, but I'm a slacker. So I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not envious of anybody. I'm not one of those go-getters. Microsoft's Bill Gates, you know, um, who Bill Gates is, he, he compared the computer industry to the auto industry. And he said, if GM had kept up with technology like the computer industry has, we would all be driving $25 cars that got 1,000 miles to a gallon. Okay, that's kind of shot across the bow, wasn't it? Well, GM came back and they said, well, that's all well and fine, but the car would crash two times a day. <laughs> kind of digging in there at Microsoft. You know, in a lot of ways, it doesn't make any sense to compare ourselves with others, but we do. We often are okay as long as someone else isn't doing better than what we are. If everyone gets a C, that's cool. I can take a C as long as everybody in the class gets a C. If everybody's out of money, that's all right. As long, you know, as, I, I don't need it as long as everybody else is out of it. We have this need to compare ourselves to others. Now, the church isn't immune from it. I forget what this said here. Oh, yeah. One church says, we care about you. And the other one says, yeah, but we got better music. <laughs> and we get dragged into the same thing in the church world as well. Churches can become extremely competitive with each other. Often the things that we are uh, competitive about or envious about are really trivial. You know, she lost some weight. Um, <laughs> She can eat whatever she wants and it doesn't stick to her. Ah, you know, it just burns me. I don't know how anybody could be like that. I can't stand her, you know. Uh, his kids are really great at sports. My kid falls down trying to walk, you know. <laughs> I just can't stand this guy. Who do they think they are? He's got a good marriage. His wife is always so sweet. She never nags. I can't stand them, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's just so trivial and the jealousy and the envy that we have. Seldom do we have an awareness of what makes us angry and prevents us from living love towards each other. Sometimes we can see things the way that God sees them, though, and we have a breakthrough. A few months ago, I was engaged uh, in a really a daily debate uh, online with some other pastors about a moral issue. And, you know, it's one of the moral issues that's really... Uh, big in our nation right now, and they were saying online that I was mean, and they were saying that I was unloving because I didn't agree with them, and I was saying online that they didn't know the Bible, 
So we kind of had a standoff there, you know. <laughs> but it just dominated my life. So one day I was complaining to another pastor about these pastors, and, and what I said was, you know, uh, they can believe what they want to believe, but what really gets me, and excuse me, I just don't understand, is why they're successful in ministry. Because some of them were. They had thriving churches. I said, I just can't understand why God would bless their ministry. Because they're obviously an heir. And I just don't understand why God would do that. And so the other pastor listened. He said, Don, uh, would you turn to, if you've got a Bible there, turn to John 21, 18. And there was silence. He says, do you, do you have it? And I said, I don't need it. I know what it is. <laughs> I can't believe that you're telling me this. I says, are you saying that that's me? He says, well, I don't know. What do you think? Is that you? So past John 21, beginning with the 18th verse, is a passage at the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. And he's up in Galilee, and he, um, the, some of the disciples are there. They're out on the Sea of Galilee, and when they're all done, uh, you know, he has that passage with John he says, you know, do you love me? And John says, oh, you know, I love you, Lord. He says, do you love me? And he does that, or with Peter, excuse me. And then, and then he looks at Peter and he says, you know, Peter, when you're old, they're going to bind your hands, they're going to stretch you out and take you where you don't want to go. And, and, and John, the writer, says what he's talking about is the kind of death that Peter is going to, going to die. Well, Peter, you know, really got him. And he's not so... Peter's not so worried about how he's going to die that he's going to have to be crucified. But he's, he looks at John, who's there, and he says, well, what about him? And Jesus says to him, what's that to you? Follow me. Wow. Peter's jealous of John. I mean, these two guys have been going at it their whole, you know, who's better, Peter or John? John's the one that Jesus loves. Peter's the one that's a rock, you know. And we have, I mean, they're with him. They're on the inner circle all the time. And you can kind of understand they're, they're both really, you know, high-achieving disciples. Uh, I think of the instance where, the, you know, on, on Resurrection Sunday, they both run down to the tomb and John outruns Peter. You're not running together. John outruns him. And then he gets to the tomb, and he stands there at the edge of the tomb, and Peter just goes right in. See, so like Peter says, well, you beat me, but I'm going in first. That was the kind of competition that they had back and forth. And what bothers Peter isn't that he's going to suffer death. What bothers him is that John might not suffer death. <laughs> That's what bothers him. And that other pastor had the guts to say that to me. And he's 20 years younger than I am. What's that to you? What does it take away from you? And I think, wow, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And it's like, okay, you got me, Lord. I'm jealous. I'm envious of these other guys. <laughs> And that's exactly what it did to me. When love is present and we are part of a group, the success of others pushes us up. It really does. When love is present, we're part of that group. Success pushes us up. We want to love like others in the group are, are loving. It, our identity comes from the group. A ambition is good. Remember, Paul begins this passage by saying, use your ambition to try to get all the greater gifts. There's nothing wrong with ambition as long as, as love is present, but when ambition is joined with jealousy or competition or arrogance, it just destroys community. I used to have a friend years ago that any time that I had something new, he would say, I wish I had that and you had a better one. I always like that saying. I wish I had that and you had a better one than what you've got, see? He didn't really want mine. Uh, he wanted me to have something better. 
Community prevents jealousy. As we've been going through this letter to Corinth every week, there has been a thread, a single message, community. They were divided. There were factions. They were not considerate of each other. They were in competition with each other. And Paul preaches community to them over and over. And why is that so important? You know, on this topic of love today, it's important because if they really knew each other, if they really knew what was going on in each other's life, if they were a community, if they were an extended family of believers, they would not be jealous because when you really know what's going on in another person's life, envy and jealousy go away. A member shared with me a saying a few months ago, if we all threw our problems in a pile and saw everyone else's, we'd grab ours back. But the thing is, we don't really see other people's problems a lot of times because we don't know what's going on. We don't know what they're struggling with. Remember in the last chapter that Paul said that if we are the body, then we hurt that somebody else is going to hurt. When we rejoice, somebody else is rejoice. We're connected. The community gives us an awareness, an empathy for each person that makes it impossible for jealousy to survive. We know what they are going through. I've been blessed through the years with sometimes being the only one who knows what people are really doing in in the church and seeing some things that are done anonymously that I can't ever share with anyone else, acts that are done like that. I've witnessed large amounts of money donated to help some people in rough times, done anonymously. Um, Saw somebody had their health care paid for for two years by a member anonymously. Never did find out, never did want anybody else to know. I saw a car paid off one time anonymously. Why? Because someone else knew what the person was going through, and they just wanted to help. They didn't want to brag about it, didn't want to be arrogant about it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. That's what a community does. The only way I know that we can overcome jealousy is to realize that the gifts that you have come from God and that other people's gifts come from God too. And when we start judging the gifts, we're actually judging God. No one achieves or earns gifts, do they? They're given to us. And the last thing here is that that love takes practice. It grows with time. Someday, he says, when, when Christ returns, when the perfect one comes... The gifts are not going to be needed. That's, that's what's meant by the last part of this chapter when Paul says, that when the perfect comes, the imperfect will be put away. When Christ returns, there will be no need for the gifts of the Spirit. They'll end. But love, it never ends. Love grows. It develops following Christ. Following means that we imitate how He lived. Following is not easy. Uh, following... And developing love is a slow process. It's never instantaneous. It's not easy because he says the road's narrow. It's not a big old wide highway that everybody can get on. You have to want to stay on the road. The following is learned. We learn how to follow by getting lost a few times and we wander off because we get distracted or we fail to listen. But it takes time. Hmm. Great message from Paul to us today here about love. It's patient, it's kind, isn't jealous, doesn't brag, isn't arrogant. It's a high mark for us, isn't it? He's calling us up. Let's let's sit in prayer for this just a minute. of his mercy 
Es tip kazan.